So I, I may look a little flustered and sweaty because it was my honor and Linda's honor too to be stuck in an elevator with these three artists for about 10, 15 minutes and our, our brave firemen came and, and rescued us. True story, this just happened. We just got off the elevator. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Todd Holmberg. I'm the director of McCain Auditorium. Standing beside me is uh, Linda Duke, director of the Mariana Kistler Beach Museum of Art. So we both would like to welcome you to this public conversation. Three artists reflect with Terrence Blanchard, Andrew F. Scott, and Kevin Wilmot as part of the Beach Museum's Art in Motion program series as they continue to celebrate their uh, 25th year. Linda. Thank you, Todd, and thank you all for being here. I want to be sure we take a minute to honor the people who have made the visit of these fantastic artists possible. Uh, the Gordon Parks Foundation, the Weary Family Foundation, and a special call out to Dale Ann Clor, the Dow Center for Multicultural and Community Studies, the Creativity Illuminated Fund, the Greater Manhattan Community Foundation's Lincoln and Dorothy Deal Community Grants Program, and the K-State Department of Art. So although this event is being presented by the Beach Museum, McCain has been a willing collaborative partner in this endeavor. So uh, Linda asked me to say a few words about one of the artists that will be uh, talking tonight, Terrence Blanchard. Uh, since we don't have written programs, uh, we will tomorrow. So all this information will be in uh, programs uh, for tomorrow night's uh, concert. I hope you all will all be there. Uh, it is free, but it does require a ticket. So arrive early or come to the box office tomorrow afternoon, and grab that ticket. Uh, so since we don't have written programs, I'll, I'll just share some of Mr. Blanchard's um, accomplishments. Uh, it is a privilege to do so. Uh, as a fellow trumpet player, uh, I've been following his career for about 35 years or so at least. So this guy, Terrence Blanchard, has uh, he's a five-time Grammy winner and has been nominated 16 times. In 2019, he was an Oscar nominee for Best Original Score for the Spike Lee director, uh, directed film, Black Klansman, a work that was co-written by one of our other speakers this evening, uh, Kevin Wilmot, who, who uh, you'll meet both of them in a, in a second. Uh, so uh, Terrence is a veteran of Art Blakey's Jazz Messengers at the ripe old age of 18. I just found that out this morning. Uh, most recently, the Metropolitan Opera presented his opera, Fire Shut Up in My Bones, marking the Met's first performance of an opera by a black composer. Uh, so I wanted to tell you real quick, this morning he did an inspirational workshop at Manhattan High School, and then again here for jazz students at, at Kansas State University. It was just so inspirational. So we need to thank uh, Terrence, uh, Terrence for that. So uh, before I hand this back over to Linda to do the rest of the introductions, I want to tell one more quick, super quick story. Uh, uh, Linda has been working on this uh, multi-day uh, uh, extended residency program with these artists for, uh, I would say, years now. So uh, when she first uh, approached me about uh, this, this whole concept of this multi-day residency, uh, uh, she, she mentioned an artist who, she, she said there needs to be some performance aspect, uh, you know, on the McCain stage. And uh, she, she brought up the name Terrence Blanchard. And I was so incredibly uh, uh, not, not, not surprised, because I, I'm never surprised at the brilliant vision of Linda Duke, but it was, it was such a happy circumstance because I had already been talking with Terrence Blanchard's agent about featuring him, inviting him to be part of the McCain performance series. So, of course, I jumped at the chance to collaborate uh, on this. So I, I just want to uh, give a shout out to Linda Duke for her vision for this uh, program. And uh, so before I give the mic uh, back to Linda once and for all, I want, to, I want you guys to give Linda a big thanks.
Todd has been just an amazing collaborator in my years here at K-State. I'm so grateful for that. And actually, it was Todd's vision that allowed us to bring a group of donors on one of the K-State art adventure trips to Los Angeles and to hear Terrence and his band play uh, at the Los Angeles Bowl during the Jazz Festival. So that was a real treat, too. All right, so now it's my honor to tell you a little bit about Andrew F. Scott, an artist and professor who talks about working at the intersection of digital fabrication technologies, traditional artistic practices, and collective cultural ideals. In 2008, he installed the world's largest gavel, as in a courtroom gavel. Uh, in the South Reflecting Pool of the Ohio Supreme Court. In 2011, he presented digital sculpture explorations at the Jepson Museum. In 2012, he was feature, the featured artist for the Cartasia Sculpture Biennial in Lucca, Italy, where his work Black Mangrove Resilience graced the historic piazza. In 2014, he became Associate Professor of Art and Technology at the University of Texas at Dallas, where he designed and developed the ATAC Fab Lab and 3D Studio. Gives many professional experiences to students through those. In 2015, he designed the cover for Grammy Award-winning jazz artist and composer Terrence Blanchard, entitled Breathless. The album was inspired by the words of Eric Garner, I can't breathe. Kevin Wilmot, known to many of you, uh, born and raised in Junction City, Kansas, and a professor at the University of Kansas. He's a film director, producer, and Academy Award winning screenwriter professor of film at the University of Kansas. In 2004, Mr. Wilmot wrote and directed the critically acclaimed feature film CSA, Confederate States of America, which premiered at the Sundance Film Festival. His 28 film, The Only Good Indian, which also premiered at Sundance, received the Best Director Award at the American Indian Film Festival and we have screened that film at the Beach Museum of Art. In 2019, he received an Academy Award and a BAFTA for the best adapted screenplay for Spike Lee's film, Black Klansman. Mr. Wilmot was named the Tallgrass 2020 Ad Astra Award winner the same year he re released his film, The 24th which he co-wrote and directed. So I hope you'll welcome these three fantastic artists to the stage to talk about why art matters now. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be free. <laughs> Certain people know what that means. So yeah. we, we were just in an elevator. That's what I meant about it's good to be free. It's good to be free. Yes, <laughs> indeed, indeed. We were stuck in an elevator and uh, it was an interesting moment in time. <laughs> Needless to say, nobody freaked out. Thank God. Close. <laughs> But nobody freaked out. Nobody freaked out. Right. Yeah, I had to channel some calm very deeply. Oh, bro, I was doing deep breathing. Y'all just didn't see it. <laughs> 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 All right, so what are we talking about? I, I, think, I think we're going to just, you know, just, you know, three brothers riffing about art kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, cool. Well, I think since we're here, I think uh, a nice place to start might be just to talk about, you know, someone mentioned Gordon Parks to you. Oh, you know, what, what would sort of come to mind, or what would you think about when somebody just mentioned or talked about uh, Gordon Parks? For me, there's so many words that come to, come, come to mind. Stylist, innovator, brilliant, uh, trendsetter. Um, you know, I think the thing that floored me about Gordon um, 
is that obviously we know about all of the photography, but when you start to really delve into his life, he was a true artist mm -hmm. in how he saw the world and how he needed to express that. You know what I mean? It wasn't just through photography. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know, it was through all different forms of art. And to me, that speaks volumes about that burning desire that's within all of us. Yeah. You know, uh, some of us, we choose a specific, you know, profession to do that. But with him, it just seemed to be boundless, you know. And I was telling him uh, earlier, I got a chance to hang out with Gordon one time at his apartment, man. And uh, we, we had dinner and we were just hanging out. And to this day, I can't remember anything he said. <laughs> you know, because I was just tripping, man. I was like, this is going on. Yeah. Man, look, and I kept looking around at all the books, yeah. mm -hmm. all of the paintings, just yeah. everything. And I think for me, what got me about being at his apartment, seeing all of that, it was just, it represented a wealth of knowledge yeah. that he had acquired, you know, and yeah. then that turned into what he was giving us, yeah. in, you know, in the world. So. It, it, it would be hard for me to boil it down to a few words. Yeah, right? it's impossible to boil it down because in many ways it's, it's like, okay, what does it mean? When you think about Gordon Parks, like what does it mean to live an artistic life? Yes. And to walk an artistic path and not only to just walk an artistic path, but walk one that is both sort of like aware and critical of the world mm -hmm. that's around you, but can slow down enough to look at and see the beauty that exists. With in. refinement and elegance. With refinement and elegance. Yes. You know, and it's, and, and I think we're on that sort of like generation because, you know, there's a generation where you're, you're a sculptor, you're a painter, right. you're a trumpet player, you're right. a writer, you know, right. you're right. just like this one thing. But when, when you looked at Gordon, it, it was the first moment in my life as a young artist that I could say, yeah, you can do it all. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You're right because the labels are limiting. Right, right, right. They're very limiting. Mm -hmm. If somebody were to say, oh, you're a trumpet player, okay, then that boils everything down yeah. to this. Right. And I don't get that with Gordon. Mm -hmm. Now, you know how he, he, you know, I think because he was so early on in so many ways, we were joking about that, how, you know, now they kind of put you in a, in a kind of category right. as much mm -hmm. as they can. Mm -hmm. But because there was only him and maybe one or two other guys, right. mm -hmm. you know, he, he, he didn't know that he wasn't supposed to do it. Right. You know? Right. So, I mean, for those of you who don't know, I mean, Gordon wasn't just a great photographer, no. but he was a, you know, he was a composer, composer. he was a poet, right. painter, painter. painter. Yep. <laughs> and, you know, and he did all of them crazy great. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and I think it's like we were joking about it. It's like, he needed to do it, so he just did it. Right. And he dispelled the myth, jack of all trades. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Because right. right. yeah. it's usually a master of none, but he was a master right. of all. Master I of all. know, <laughs> man. And that's the thing that was so intimidating about being in his apartment, because he had some paintings up, and you go, OK. You know, and then you just look around, and you go, and you just think about everything that he's done, and then you just feel so inadequate. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm like, man, the only thing I'm doing is playing a trumpet. This guy is, like, incredible with everything that he's done. And it's been a true inspiration. And I think the other thing, too, for me, and this is just for me, one of the things that I think is important to talk about with guys like Gordon, because it just doesn't apply to him, but it applies to my father and a lot of African-American men of that generation, they weren't angry. Right, yeah. They weren't angry black men, right. you know what I mean? Right. They had the knowledge, I mean, don't get me wrong, they had a fury behind what was going on, but they knew how to attack that in such yes. a way that it dealt with elegance, you know what I mean? Yes. And, and in a way that was like, like what we were just talking about, yes. that was like uh, on a high level. And I think that inspired me too, because when I came along, you know, I was like fiery, I wanted yes. to, yeah. Change the world and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> right. And he was changing the world, but in such a smart way. Yeah. That it's just, it was truly something to behold. And you know, so most of you guys out there probably know he's a Kansas guy. Mm -hmm. And his book, A Choice of Weapons, is exactly what, you, what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, that, you know, Kansas was not good to Gordon Parks. Mm -hmm. and, and The Learning Tree, the film The Learning Tree is is basically kind of his story. Mm -hmm. it's, it's fictional, but it's a lot of his stories in it. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, he, he caught hell with this. Right. And, but he didn't get angry. <laughs> At least his anger, he then chose the weapon of art to express. Mm -hmm. exactly. And that, that for me was a big, big thing for me growing up. Yes. I mean, that, his book, and, and when you read his book, and if you've not read his book, A Choice of Weapons, it's, it's really a, a terrific book. Mm -hmm. Because it, it really, you know, he just goes through all these, his journey from, from leaving Fort Scott, Kansas, mm -hmm. and goes to Minnesota, plays in these blues yes. joints, yes. and he's, that's where, as, and, yes. and he, and he's all self-taught. I mean, everything is self-taught. So he, he's, you know, he's playing in these blues joints, and, right. and prostitutes, and right. killers, and all kind of stuff all, all around him. Right. And, and then he goes to New York, and, and happenstance kind of gets a camera, and happenstance kind of runs into the Life Magazine guy. Isn't that crazy? And yeah. then becomes a Life Magazine photographer. Right. And then becomes the first black director of a studio feature film. Mm. Right. Very right. first one. Right. Right. Which is the learning tree. Learning tree. Shot in Fort Scott, Kansas. Kansas yeah. mm. So, you know, it's, I mean, it's such a, a great story. Yes. You know, because it's, it's like you said, it's kind of all of our stories. Right. They, they talk about that, they often talk about that greatest generation, but I think we all grew up with that resolute generation. Mm -hmm. You know, the, that generation of uh, men and women that just had to do what needed to be done. Mm -hmm. And what it brings, it brings this like, uh, and if you look at Graham's life, it's the audacity of yes. Yes. Every, every important opportunity that he had in his life, and you've seen this, you know, you, you've seen this in our lives as artists, you're confronted with something that you're asked to do creatively that you've never done before. Mm -hmm. And it's on the line, but you have the courage to say, yes, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I can do yes. that. Yes. Yeah. Then, but then you go back there and you dive as deep as you can in the shed and say, <laughs> what have I gotten myself into? Oh, and then, yes, and, yes, and, indeed. And, and then yeah. you move on. And in so many disciplines, that was the, you, we have an example of that in Gordon, to see that kind of uh, resolute audacity to say, yes, I can do this. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, listen, man, that, that's been my whole career. Mm -hmm. When Spike called me to do a film, I didn't know how to write music. Right. film by show called my composition teacher as soon as I got off the phone with Spike I was like yo man I got this yo so I hell <laughs> you know and the same thing happened when when they asked me to write an opera after I was trying to smell a dude's breath to see if he was drunk so I asked him to, you want me to write an opera <laughs> really right. uh, I called Roger again you know yeah. and you know what was the funny thing about each time the first time I called him, and I, and I guess this is a testament because I know these two guys, so I know, I know the the, the amount of, of dedication they've given to their craft, mm -hmm. right? And it's something you always want to try to get across to your students, you know. Charlie Parker said, "It ain't magic; it just seems like it is." It just seems like it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So so when I called Roger the first time, when Spike asked me to do Jungle Fever, I said, "Man, I got this. Problem. I don't know what to do." He said, "Trust your training." That was the first thing he said. And then when it came time to do the opera, uh, same thing. I was freaking out. I'm like, bro, I never read, written an opera before. What am I going to do? He said, tell a story. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, and it was interesting because his voice and his words and the demeanor with which he told it to me gave me confidence. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. And I wonder who was that for Gordon? Mm -hmm. You know what yeah. I mean? If he had that. You know, I, I, from what he writes, it seems to maybe be his mother. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know? Uh -huh. uh, but, you know, it's always somebody like that. You know, we've all, yes, I think right. we've all probably been fortunate to have mm -hmm. folks in our lives that, that encouraged us and said, you know, I know it doesn't make any damn sense, but do it anyway. <laughs> you know? <laughs> right, right, and, yeah, right. And, and just don't give up. Right. right? Which is so much a big, a big part of, of art. Right. It's just don't give up. It's right. like when, you know, like from my, my experience, it was... Um, you know, my first film took me nine years to finish. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there was, you know, every morning I'd get in the shower and I had to tell myself, you know, I visualized the premiere of the film. Wow. In yes. my head. Yes. You know, yes. and and you just keep on you keep on going. Right. You know, right. and uh, and in so many ways, that's kind of if you don't if you're not willing to do that, it's not going to happen. Right. But the other the other thing too that I love about 
Gordon after meeting him, he was a man who had every right to have the biggest ego on the planet, mm -hmm. but he didn't. And I think not having the ego is the thing that allowed him to realize, I don't know this, but let me learn. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yes. And I, that's the thing I think to get so many young kids in trouble because if I don't know something about a topic, I'm going to tell you, right. right? Because I'm not going to be that guy that get caught out there trying to be something that I'm not. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll tell you that I don't know, but the next week <laughs> or the week after that, brother gonna have some information. Right, right, right. <laughs> you yes. know what I mean? Because I'm gonna do yeah. my homework, right. Right. you know what I mean? And I think with those guys, that was the thing about them. Yeah. You know, uh, from my experiences with all of the great jazz artists that I play with and all of the guys that I got a chance to meet, all of the artists like, like Gordon Parks and others that I've met, that seemed to be their thing. They were in search of truth. truth. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And it's also that, that thing that when we were working on the project, the thing that we recognized early on, it's that empathetic impulse. Yes. That's the, I, and I, when I was talking to the students, I was like, you know, that's your artistic superpower. Mm. That's the one skill that you have to develop. You have to develop that empathetic impulse because it feeds into curiosity. Yes. It also feeds into engaging people in a way that will allow them, and listening in a way that allow them to, for you to enter into their lives in a, in a way that you can learn their truth and mm -hmm. by extension begin to engage in your own personal truths. And yes. when you look at the most important work that Gordon did over his career. It always led with um, it always led with him. empathy. Was was the sure. thing that opened the door, and also yes. the thing that made him able to make just this incredible work because mm -hmm. he was looking and engaging his subjects in that way. And there was this empathetic truth that he was always trying to tell. Yeah, you know, yeah. And, and it's that honesty that that informs almost all of the work that I, that I that I do, and it, and it comes directly um, from him. You know, it's that thing we were talking earlier <clears throat> about how, and, you know, I know you know about, the, about this too, Terrence, how, you know, the, the technology with music now and mm -hmm. the technology with art <laughs> and the technology with film in some ways, uh, it can kind of separate you from that empathy. Right. You, know, you know what I mean? Yes. You know how, you know, yes. what, is that, does that happen with you with, with music? Yeah, it, ha it, it well, it happens with my students. And the thing that I've always tried to teach them is that, you know, the technique is there for you to tell a story. It's not the other way around. You know what I mean? So when you, and, and the wild part about it is that when you start to, you, for me, my technique grows when there's a story that I'm trying to tell and I'm having difficulty telling it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I have to develop this technique to get, to be, to speak clearer. Yeah. You know, and I think, one of the things that I've always loved about great artists like that, because I'm also thinking about Baldwin mm -hmm. and uh, uh, an Invisible Man. Uh, Alex Wilson. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, those guys, there they seem to be this almost, I don't want to say childlike, but there's this honesty mm -hmm. in what you were talking yeah. about, the, the empathetic thing of looking at the world. But there's also a certain type of... Uh, frailty and being honest about how you see that. Mm -hmm. You know yeah. what I mean? Yes. It's like you, because one of the things that I, I, I tell, <laughs> you know, I, I tell young students all the time, you know, and I know it's probably the same thing in, your, in you guys' world. Mm -hmm. The easiest thing to do is to play like John Coltrane. Mm -hmm. The easiest thing to do is to play like Miles Davis. Because right. you know that people love Miles Davis and they love John Coltrane, right? The hardest thing to do is to dig down in your soul and to find those notes, those harmonies, those rhythms that mean something to you, then to just throw that out there to the public to possibly be rejected. Right. That's a terrifying notion for some people. Yes. Right? Yes. But for me, it's been a healing one. Yes. And it's been a necessary one. That's the thing that I've, I've come to realize since Hurricane Katrina, that event flipped my whole script about what music means to me because Music, and I didn't realize it at first, but we used to talk about this because the thing you don't know about him and I, we've been knowing each other back from when we both lived in Brooklyn years ago. And when, you know, we are, he, you know, he didn't like me telling the story, but you know, <laughs> when he left New York to go to school, man, he was at a certain state and he was like, yo, man, 
send me some music, bro. <laughs> so I would make these cassette tapes for him of like great music, and right. that would be the thing that helped yeah. him, right? Well, it was doing the same thing for me, yeah. you know? And then you start to realize that's what art has always been doing for us. Yes. You yeah. know, it's been a healing thing. And the only way to help other people heal is to deal with your own trauma, mm -hmm. to deal with your own demons, yeah. and to be honest about it. You know, not to sugarcoat it and say, oh, man, I got it together. No, I'm a frail person just like anybody else with, with, with faults just like anybody else. I just tend to look at them, hopefully with an honest lens, mm -hmm. you know, to, which will allow that to, to resonate with other people who are dealing with similar issues. Yeah, because it's kind of funny because I'm sitting here, we're all of us of uh, the same age. And this careful, is what, careful, and, careful, and this careful. Is, and this is what I But I, I will say this: it's it's a great age to be. Yes. Because, as you were saying, my, my dear Aunt Audrey put us together all mm -hmm. those many years ago on Washington Avenue. Yes. And she was that mother that yes. Gordon Parks had that told yeah. him that yeah. you're expected to be excellent. Yeah. You're expected to do excellent things. And yes, mm -hmm. you want to be an artist, be an artist. Right. But be the best artist that you can be, and go out there in the world and do that but the flip side that move from brooklyn marked this sort of change where i lived in this analog world of welding steel sculptures together of getting into like a lot of the digital things that i that i do now and, and i teach young people how to make art using technologies and the trap is always as you said music is this technological virtuosity because it's just the tools are new the, and a lot of times they're mimicking old art forms a la playing like Charlie Parker and yeah, Davis. Right, yeah, too much reverence. And, and, and it's like, okay, yeah, we can do this with this tool, so it's really right. important. No. Right. What's the story that you are telling that's unique, that can only be told with these tools? Exactly. Right. Exactly. That can only, that can, and, and I have to really thank, thank you because, yeah, you, all those many years ago, you gave me my music education. Oh, dude. You know, in jazz, mm -hmm. uh, while I was there in Ohio, working through <laughs> a lot of things in my mind. But, but it was reciprocal right. because he was always working on art. You know, he would make jewelry. You know, I had the hippest vibe sometimes because people didn't know where my jewelry came from. <laughs> and I wasn't telling them. You know what I mean? So, uh, and then, you know, it was like he's talking about. It was great to watch his talent grow. Because, man, he used to do these huge, like, fertility dolls, but in metal, you know? And I was telling Kevin before, he actually, I have them at home. I have these, these, these African, uh, how do you describe them? Ashanti, they're Ashanti a, stools. Ashanti they're stools. And Ashanti stools from Ghana. And, they're, and they're, they, they look like wood, but they're made from steel. And then to see that and where he is now in his development, I remember he also, I remember when you started cutting steel, mm -hmm. you did the slave ship that was down in New Orleans. Right. He, did, he did this this exhibit of a slave ship that you can walk around. Wow. And the top part of it was a cutout of the imagery mm -hmm. from the slaves being laid next to each other. Oh, yeah, slave ship Brooks, yeah. Man, that was a powerful, powerful piece, yeah. Yeah. you know? And we've always wanted to work together, um, you know? So we've last few years, we've gotten a chance to really do some things together. And now that he's doing the digital mapping thing, as you'll see tomorrow, man, it's like crazy what he does, you know? And the reason why it's crazy is because he didn't come to digital mapping just for digital mapping. Mm -hmm. He came to it as a bona fide artist who had something to say. This is just another tool by which he could speak with, mm -hmm. you know? And it's the same thing for me with what I'm doing with my band, you know? I grew up listening to Miles Davis. I grew up listening to Charlie Parker and John Coltrane. But we have an electric band now, right? And part of that is because we're trying to take advantage of what those colors can be used for. Because a lot of times when people think of those instruments, they think of a certain type of music, right, that doesn't adhere to a certain aesthetic right. artistically, right? right? Yeah. And one of the things, one of, and it's one of the reasons why we put together the band, yeah. you know, is because we're trying to show people, no, if Stravinsky or Tchaikovsky or any of those guys were living today, I'd be willing to bet they'd probably be using these things. Yes. You know, because the organ was the first synthesizer known to man, wow. you know? 
And I know people have resistance for those things, but to me, the resistance talks about your limitation right. and how you view art, right? Art is supposed to be boundless. Right. You know, you can't sit down and say and put it in this box. You know, it's something we've been going through, and I'm gonna get off the subject, but, but it's something we've been going through with the opera. And I think it's something that needs to be talked about because, you know, with Five Shut Up In My Bones, we had an all African-American cast. And prior to the production of that, man, I had a conversation with Karen Schlack and some other singers, and they were in tears, dude, because they were telling me how being an opera singer, they're taught to turn off who they are. Wow. So some, a lot of them come from the church. Right. Right? A lot of them, was, was, some of them were R&B singers, some of them were jazz singers. And they're told to turn that off, right, to sing a certain way, to sing Puccini, which I can understand. Sure. I can get it. But the thing that I feel proud about what we're doing in opera is I told them, bring all of that back to what we're doing, because yeah. this is a current story, yeah. and this is all about what's been reverberating around the world, right? Yeah. So, and it's been amazing. This, this, this young lady, Angel Blue, man, she sings this one aria, uh, peculiar grace and when she did she comes from the church right but she's a beautiful soprano and when she started combining her soprano voice operatic voice with her church phrasing man in rehearsal there wasn't a dry eye in the place mm -hmm. and the reason why there wasn't a dry eye in the place because we knew what that is yes. we know what that is yes. we haven't seen that right and that's the thing that I get from people like Gordon mm -hmm. it's like no there's a necessity to say something, yes, yes, right? Yes. And then you find a means. Oh, I'm a photographer right now. Doesn't mean that my heart and my eye has been turned off. That's right. You know what I mean? Oh, I'm going to paint. That thing is still within me to speak those truths. And and that thing you're talking about is is really just being yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, and and so much of the time, all the voices around you kind of tell you not to be yourself. And and for all the different reasons that they tell us not to be ourselves. Mm -hmm. And you've got to have kind of the courage to kind of hold on to you, that part of yourself that you know is right. Yes. That you know is, is important. Yes. It's like you were saying about those singers, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the school is telling them, the school of music is telling them to divorce yourself from that part of yourself mm -hmm. in this space. Mm -hmm. But jazz was created out of all of those influences mm -hmm. coming together, right? You, you were New Orleans, you, you, you tell us. But, yeah, no, but, you, you know, know, you're right. You know the deal, and, and, and great art, you look at Picasso, you look at you know, all the different things that broke things open in terms of art. Mm -hmm. You know, those folks did not allow these outside forces to kind of come in and dictate who they were. Yes, mm -hmm. and and so much, you know, especially as you guys know, being black, you know, we've all had to kind of, and women deal with it. Everybody deals with it. Gay folks deal with it. You have to kind of have that extra sense of self to hold on to that piece that you know is vulnerable that you may lose, mm -hmm. and then you then have to extend that extra part of yourself and put that in your art. And make it vulnerable, right? In, in that <laughs> right, 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 right. You know, right. so you're, you're, it's your voice. It's you know, if I had made all these small movies on my own, outside of any help from Hollywood, I could have never developed one. Mm -hmm. You know, it's right. just like you guys. You know, right. we, you know, we had to just do our yes, thing, yes. and nobody was helping us. No. And just like, just like you know, just like yeah. Gordon out here in the middle of no damn where, just trying to do his thing, right? And and that's the piece that you don't ever want to lose. No. Right. No. And there's always this weird, there's always like this weird place <laughs> that you have to walk between, and one of my, one of my favorite uh, people in, in Dallas is this older gentleman that I'm friends with, and he's like one of my best critics, which is why I love him, because he's always just really honest. And he often says that a lot of my work is angry, like anything that mm -hmm. I have in it that has a fist. <laughs> just don't like it. 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 Hey. And, and from time to time, I'll have him come into the shop, and I've done projects from, for him where it's almost like a 
Chamber of Commerce experience. <laughs> These objects that come from like that point of view. We all do this. You know, right, we all do it. Right. Right. As Gordon would say, that's the work. You, know, right. you, you, you do the work. You got you got you, you photographic models today. You're gonna make them look beautiful. You right. do flowers. You're gonna make them look beautiful. Right. You gotta, if you got to go and talk with a gang leader, you're gonna meet with him, and you're gonna make it beautiful. Right. And, but and, and and I had the opportunity to have him in the in our um, auditorium the other, a couple days ago. And he was in the, he, he was in the booth control booth with me, so he could hear the music and he could see this sculpture that's illuminated. And I go, well, that's not a fist, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What did he say? Was he cool? He looked at, yeah, he looked at me. He, 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 he actually, I won't tell you what he did, but it was funny. Like, I know I was making fun of him. Yeah, but, but you know that's that. a, that's the thing that you're saying though, man. That that you know so much of of the black thing. Anger, anger is attached to it right. because of our experience. Mm -hmm. But in many ways, it's not anger. Right. No, it's it's more than anything. It's acknowledgement. Yeah. Yes. It's it's like I'm not blind to the world. I'm right. not I'm not going to lie to myself. I'm not going to lie about the world that mm -hmm. surrounds me. I'm not going to lie. Mm -hmm. And that's that's I love when you guys talk about story in your art because I don't yeah. think people think of connect story to music or story to visual art you know what I mean in, in so many different ways because but in the end we're all just trying to tell our story we all we're, we're trying to tell a story we're trying to tell other people's story and we're trying to do it in a way that could really hit people in the heart you know um I, I it's interesting because you know I've had an experience like that where um with this band that's going to play tomorrow night our first two albums the first one was called breathless and the second one was called live and both albums were dedicated to uh, i can't breathe and black lives matter campaigns right and um it was interesting because when we recorded the live one we were in cleveland and we were playing live we were playing and after the set this guy walked over to me and you got to remember i had just put together this band so a lot of people were still used to me having my jazz band, the acoustic band. And uh, he walked over to me and uh, he said, man, I thought I was going to hear the music from A Tale of God's Will, which is the music from Spike Lee's uh, documentary, When the Levies Broke. And as soon as he said that, I was like, uh-oh, this is going to be one of those kind of conversations. <laughs> right. I was preparing Here we myself. go. Right, right, here we go. <laughs> and he said, because when you started playing, he said, you sounded so angry. That was the word that was used. He said, you sounded angry. The music just sounded angry. He said, but then you told us what the music was about. Right. Yeah. Right? When I introduced the band. Then he said the most profound thing to me. He said, it made me rethink my position on gun control. Wow. Mm -hmm. And then I started to think that's the power of art. Okay. Yes. You know yes. what I mean? Because how many discussions have we been having around this in right. this country? Mm -hmm. And it hasn't been anybody bending or yielding in either direction. Mm -hmm. Right. Right? right, but art. Anything is getting worse. Right, right. And, but art, in some ways, has a way to break through that, in in various moments in time. You yeah. know, there's there's this. I remember the first time I heard John Coltrane play Four Little Girls. Uh, it's a tune called Alabama, mm -hmm. which is written for the Four Little Girls. I was I never forget it. I was in Perugia, Italy, and they were showing all of these videos. Uh, this theater, jazz videos, as part of this festival. And when they played that one, man, I just cried yeah. like a baby because I could hear yes. all of the pain and, 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 and suffering yeah. and what it, what it was that he was doing, right? Now, that's not anger. No. It's no. like you said, it's an acknowledgement of what these four little girls went through, you know? Yeah. And I think, you know, in, in, the, in the, this world of art that we are in, we can never, never, ever divorce ourselves away from our history. It's just impossible. I don't see how you can. No. But they want us to. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've, 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 uh, yeah, I've, I've had uh, issues with that because um, when I first got into the operatic world, you know, they necessarily didn't want me to write about what I wrote about. Yeah. You know, and I said, you know, no, I'm not doing those stories. Or, just like simple things, you know, I'm proud of the fact that now when I do film scores in LA, we have mixed orchestra. Mm -hmm. You know, I told the contractor when I first started working in LA, and she's a very sweet woman, uh, Sandy the Crescent. She was just lovely. She did all of the films in LA. And I said, Sandy, I love you. I said, but I can't walk out there in front of an all white orchestra. I just can't do it 
not knowing the people that I know who are capable of doing this work, yeah. right? And so they made an effort, good for her, to go out and find people. Yeah. And now as a result, she's retired, the guy who took over for Peter Rotter, they have a list of all of these people. And some of the kids, man, are driving from Canada, New York, they, drove, they come all the way out to LA wow. just to be a part of the projects, you know? And to me, that's part of that thing of when you get into a position, you can't turn it off. No, you can't. No. You can't turn it off. You can't forget who you are mm -hmm. in the midst of all of this, that's right. you know? So that's what's happening to me now in the operatic world. So when, when the opera just premiered in Chicago at the Lyric, you know, afterwards, we all went to this one little area, this, this restaurant bar, and Casey Lemons, who wrote the libretto, was there with our husband, Vondi, and we were sitting at a table, and I said, Casey, look at this. This is beautiful to watch these young artists be so empowered, not because of the moral victory. That's what we are into, the moral victory of doing this all-black opera, but it's the fiscal victory of it selling tickets, right. which is something that means something in this world right. that we're in. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's empowering them. And one of the things that we stipulated is that anybody who's in our production has to get an audition. Wow. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So we're trying to affect change yes. in the small ways. And I learned that from who? Spike. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. I saw Spike take on the Teamsters mm -hmm. in New York. And, I, and I'm like, bruh, you know, Spike's <laughs> but this big. I'm like, bruh, the Teamsters. Them boys are serious. I know, yeah. I know. And they didn't, for the longest time, they never had a black foreman you know, on any of the projects. Mm -hmm. They had black drivers, but they didn't right. have black foremen. And Spike told them, he said, listen, I'm gonna go non-union, you know, and it turned it turned things around. And that's, that's, that's part of that thing that people confuse with anger. Yes. Right. Because yes. it's not anger, it's just acknowledgement of where we are and where we need to go. And, and the fact that he was willing to take that risk to acknowledge it, mm -hmm and extend himself, because yes. he didn't have to. Not at all. Mm -hmm. He didn't have to. Not at all. And then everybody, not just the black folks that, or other brown folks that got a baby an extra opportunity, mm -hmm. but that helps the white people in that space too. That's what mm -hmm. I was, man, I was just, you know what I was gonna say? One of the things about telling these stories that you have to always couch it in is that it makes it sound like you're so pro-black, but it's not. We are pro-talent. Yes. Right? You know what I mean? So, like, I remember the first time I went to one of Spike's sets, I was shocked because when you listen to him talk, you think there'd be black people everywhere. Right. Right? But it's not the case. Right. Whoever is the best person for the job gets the job. Gets the job. I watched him fire some dudes. Man, they, they came in one day and looked at the dailies and 80% of that stuff was out of focus. Man, they had this little Italian woman the next day on their camera. <laughs> Working, I didn't even know where she came from. <laughs> right? She's brand new. Yeah. She was on the job. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's the thing that I think people get confused. Yes. With. Right. It's yes. like we don't want extra treatment. We want fair treatment. That's you right. You know, if I can do the job, please give me an honest shot at doing the job. It's that, it's that word that we call equity. Yes. Uh, and we, and, we, and we, we bandy that, that word around and reflecting on, on Gordon, I'm always trying to bring it back there in some mm -hmm. ways, is that he was part of that generation that was so important to us because it was like the first, the first, the oh, first, the first, first. Yes. Them days are over now. Right. <laughs> Those days are over. We live in a world now where talent is global and it's everywhere. And in every occupation and in almost every avocation, there are people that you can, choose to work with from any de demographic you choose to um, focus on. And I would hope that moving forward and the way forward, I, I sort of feel, is in just like the authentic truths that we reveal. Yes. Because the best art, the best of anything, you're, you're a jazz man, you're a writer, I'm an artist, you realize that the best art's always created through bringing two things together that shouldn't be together, that don't make any sense being together, but when those two things come together, it's just like boom, boom. Right. And, and, right. and there's like this, this truth bomb that goes off. Right. And in the you know, shattering mist, you know, that clears a little bit. You just see this beautiful thing that you could never imagine and could me, ever exist. Let me just tell you guys this as a person <laughs> who is in the midst of the boom <laughs> with him. <laughs> you know, one of the things you have to go on trust. Right. 
you have to operate out of trust because I'm on stage and I'm playing. I can't see what's behind me, right? But we have done shows together where he's had people in tears because of the imagery, right? And I remember we were doing one of the shows with, uh, with Rennie Harris yes. and uh, I saw some like just still photos from it. I was floored by it because I don't know how to explain it, but it's like this thing, like working with him when we worked on the film together. When you come into this unexpected place and you find commonality, mm, yes. mm. it's it's a it's a thing where it and I and I, I hope I'm not overstating it, but it really makes you feel not you're, like you're not alone. I guess. Because most of the time we're creating art in a solitary environment. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But when we come together with these types of projects, you go, oh, okay, you too. Yes. You get it. Yes. You, right? Yes. I was, just in, I was just in Richmond, Virginia this weekend at a film festival, and they showed Black Klansman. Mm -hmm. And they showed one of my movies called CSA, Confederate States of America. And it was interesting because there was a young man there, and, you know, this is Virginia, mm -hmm. you know, kind of the, this is kind of like where the Confederacy, well, it was, yep. the, Richmond is the capital of the Confederacy. I was about to say. The capital. Yep. It's the capital of the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. And this young man came up to me and he said, you know, your film, um, it really helped me in my evolution of, of being deprogrammed. Ooh. The state of Virginia had programmed me as a kid to believe in the Confederacy. Mm. And your film helped deprogram me. Mm. And he was thanking me for that. Yes, isn't that correct? That's beautiful, you actually. That's and and I, said, I told him, I said, hey, man, I said, I said that made the whole damn movie worthwhile right there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then when, I was, when we were looking at Black Klansmen, and this is so much about what we're talking about, that, you know, when I'm in my room, my office, writing, and, speci and specifically it was a scene where they do the target practice. Oh, dude. And, and there's a, there's dude. a scene in, in Black Klansmen where they're, the Klan guys are target practicing. Yeah. And they're target practicing on this image that I just happened to run into online. Oh, really? Yes, I ran into it before with Black Klansmen. I just happened to run into it, like, uh -huh. you know, a couple years earlier. Uh -huh. It's called the running nigger target. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's an image of a black figure. He's got an afro and he's running. And, and, and it's a target for people to shoot at. Yes. I thought Spike made that for the movie. Yeah. I, I got that online, bro. I know he told me, he told me, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so, so, so I wrote that into the scene that that's what those guys, because that's what they shoot at. Right, mm -hmm. right. So th th they're shooting at that. But, you know, when you write that scene and the context it's in. How do you write that? Well, you know, it's, it's technical, <laughs> but it's technical, you know, it, it, right. it's exterior, you know, woods, right. Right. Game, yeah. right. uh -huh. you know, the Klan guys out target price, so that's right. context, right? And then, right. yeah, the, you know, but then when you come in and put the whammy on it yeah. with the music, mm -hmm. <laughs> and the thing about music and movies right. that's so profound. magical and profound is that music's invisible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so, and, and, and the visual is not, it's a total visual, right? I mean, so it's a thing and it's connecting to right. this invisible thing. Right, right, right. And it just, the music, your music in that scene, it just lifts the scene to such a whole other level. No, oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and, it's, and it's magic. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just magic. But and because your music, you know, because what happens, they, they do the target practicing, and then John David Washington's character, the, the, black, the black Klansman, right. comes in afterwards, and, and then it's revealed, the running nigger target is revealed. Right. Because we don't know what they're shooting at, and then it's revealed this is right. what they're shooting at. Right. And it is your music that makes us feel the, the horror of that. Right. Right. It's, it's, it's the acting, it's the visual, it's all that stuff, but right. it's your music mm -hmm. that really kind of touches your heart. Well, thank you for saying that, but I, I have to deal with it in something he said to you, because for all of the students that are out there, there is a combination of watching that 
and being phys being emotionally hurt yes. by it, combining that with your skill and your technique. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. that's when the technique comes into play. Yes. Because for me, I'm looking at it, and I and and and, and I'll just be honest with you. I, I remember working on that scene. I cried working on that scene because I thought, wow, who would do that? And then when Spike told me that was something that you could buy online now, yeah, I really was hurt, right? So I'm watching that scene and I keep going to myself, okay, you cannot reveal this thing too early. That's the technical side of me. Right. But it's all based on an emotional response to what it is that I'm looking at. So I'm gonna have to pick a point for where the music has to, has to bloom to get that emotional response. So that's where it comes into that whole thing of learning your craft. Yes. And, and knowing your craft and knowing what tools you need to get the desired effect you're looking for. Yes. And then sometimes, obviously, we all have those happy surprises right. of things that, that come along. But I remember, dude, I worked on that scene a lot. Yeah. Because the thing, that's the, that scene and then the scene where um, uh, they were listening to the radio woman, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I forgot her name. In the in Five Bloods. Yes. No. No. Black Clansman. Black Clansman. Oh. Mm -hmm. No. Oh, five oh, Bloods. You're right. Yeah. In five Bloods. You're right. You're right. You're Five Bloods. That's a, so oh, Tokyo Rose. Right. Yeah. right. Tokyo Rose. Yeah. yeah. So that was a, that scene too is one that broke my heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Listening to it, these guys out there fighting for our country. Yeah. Right. And they're being told that they're less than. Yeah. Right. So it's one. Those, those two scenes represent the whole notion of what it means to allow your emotions to guide what it is that you do, but use your technique and your skill to refine it and shape it to be what it needs to be. Yeah, yeah. That's funny, because I, I find that as I, in my um, younger age, it was, uh, there was just a lot of ego Yes. In the work, in virtuosity. Yeah. Because I'm, cause I'm yeah. bad, you know? Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Uh, but now, Nobody else goes, huh? during, during this time, there's just, it's, right. it's always in the editing. Yes. Yes. And what you, what you pull back right. and what you cut. Yes. Right? And just how little, and, and you see this in like, you always see this in Gord's work also, mm -hmm. just, just how, how little and how subtle you can be or we in our class we always refer to as an economy of means right you know telling a story telling a right. story making music saying a phrase writing some writing some dialogue mm -hmm. with economy of means where you're editing and, yeah. and i think that's right. the thing that comes with age you just yeah. you, you, learn to be a better editor you, you're so right because the, it's the it's the editing and that's mm -hmm. kind of what you're describing too mm -hmm. with how but what made that scene work so great mm -hmm. is it's you kind of, your first draft kind of, you lay it all out there. Yeah. Right. And then you're just, you know, and screenwriting is like just a constant cutting back, cutting back, cutting back, cutting. And that's really hmm. all, the, all of our artists that really, right. Mm -hmm. right. you know? Right. I mean, that's why, you know, to not have the Academy Award for editing is <laughs> on TV is like, no, ridiculous. Sorry. There's the movie you. There's the movie you write. Ridiculous. The movie you shoot. Right. And the movie you edit. Right. And those are three different films. I'm working on a film right now. They 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 don't have the full first edit together. They've just put the assembly together, and it's three and a half hours. <laughs> Some editing will have to happen. Oh, the editing's about, definitely about to go on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. You know. Three and a half hours. That ain't gonna go down. So yeah. You know, but yeah. that. But 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 look. That's when you have to make those crucial decisions. Yes. What is the most essential thing about telling a story? What is the thing that really gets to the heart of what it is that I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a there's a saying. You don't really finish a film. You abandon it. Wow. <laughs> and because yes. there's there's yes. nothing that ever tells you stop. Right. Woo. You know, you can just keep working on a movie forever. Woo. So at some point, you just have to say, I'm done. I was working with a director. The man in front of you said that. I was working with a director. They were calling me up saying, well, you know, hey, man, he's, he's, he's you know, we're editing this thing. We want to show it to you. I'm like, the movie's being released next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What are you talking about? Oh, yeah. About? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I know guys that would they be showing the movie in Kansas City, and they're still shooting a scene trying to stick it in there next week, you know? Yes. Oh, yeah. So that sculpture um, in the back of my studio has some hope, huh? <laughs> some hope, brother. Oh, you bro. got to it up, man. Oh, man, come on, bro. I remember, dude, there was a phrase. There was a funny that you say that. There was a musical phrase that I, that I'd stolen from one of my piano teachers, Kenny Barron. 
had come to my house for a rehearsal, and I had taped the rehearsal, and he played play, play this phrase, be doo dee 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 be doo be be doo be and I couldn't never finish it. And I was like, man, bro. And it was like a couple of years, and I always said, man, I got to do something, because he would do something with his left hand with the horn, be doo dee 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 go and it would answer, right? We were someplace in some small little town, bro. I'm telling you, it's about two years later, right? And, I, and our driver was late coming to pick us up. And there was a piano in the lobby. And I sat down, and for some reason, without me thinking about it, and my eyes getting, oh, man, let me write that shit down real quick. <laughs> Yeah. Before I forget it, you know. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, there's yeah. always hope for that thing that's sitting in the back, right? Yeah. <laughs> you walk by it, nigga, it got dust all over it. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I think we're getting the hook here, bro. Yeah. Okay. Oh. It's just starting to get good. Yeah. Yeah, okay. this is too good to interrupt, but we did want some time Question. for you all to hear thoughts from the audience, <laughs> and I think. Uh, and the cane staff has set microphones out on both side aisles. So if people would like to make a comment or ask a question, and she while has I'm waiting right there. for people to gather right their there. courage, I just want to say, as you notice, these folks are reacting go to ahead, the on. exhibition at the Mariana Kistler Beach Museum of Art, Gordon Park's Homeward to the Prairie, I Come. And I would like to call out the fact that the curators of that exhibition are in the audience, at least one of them right now, Eileen Wong. Thank you, Eileen. <laughs> <laughs> and that the director of the Gordon Parks Museum in Fort Scott, Kirk Sharp, is here. With us. So I'm going to point to people to give you a chance, and then don't leave when the questions are over because we have a surprise at the end, okay? Uh -oh. Okay, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, my question is. How long did it take for each of you to find your voice as an artist? And what kind of experiences would you encourage young artists to seek out to help find their own voice? Um, well, I still haven't found my voice. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The struggle's real. Yes. Um, I, I would say to you, uh, be honest to yourself. Mm -hmm. that's, that's like one of the most important things. Be honest to yourself, and as a young artist, trust that uh, where you are is not where you're going to be 10 years from now, five years from now, two years from now, 20 years from now. But get on the journey and, 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 and trust that the road will get you there. You know, if there's, if there's something I could tell you, the thing I would say is you already have your voice. It just You have to just declutter it. The voice is already there. You know, I tell my students all the time, nobody told you what to wear. You didn't come here dressed like anybody else. So you already have your personality and it's inside of you. You know, you just have to, that's where the whole thing of working on your skill really helps to define that. You know, and if you have something to say, you have a desire to say something, it's gonna come through in your voice. The times when people can't find their voice is when they don't have confidence in themselves. Yeah. And they start to copy other things, you know what I mean? And trying to mimic other, other styles, you know? And I did that when I was, you know, we kind of all do that when you, when you start, right? But then you start to, re I never, I remember the first time I learned the Clifford Brown solo and I wanted to play it live, it didn't work. <laughs> you know, <laughs> wait a minute, man, it sounds so hip when Clifford played it. <laughs> and I started to realize it because it wasn't my, it wasn't my thing, so. Yeah. Just, just constantly work on your craft. The voice is already there. Yeah, I was second what Terrence and, and Andrew are saying. Um, you know, uh, one of the things I love to say is that, you know, people always say write what you, what you know, but also you should write what you believe in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and a lot of times that can be a very unpopular thing, you mm -hmm. know. And so, but that's, if that's what you believe in, that's who you are. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, and that also, that's the thing that kind of, can make you special. You know, it's it's like what, what 
everyone's saying here is, you know, holding on to yourself is not an easy thing. Mm -hmm. You know, especially in the world of art, because, you know, art is always telling you to kind of compromise and, and, and the money's over here. You know, I always make the joke, it's like, you know, there's a talking dog movie made $18 billion at the box office last week. Well, I'm, like, well, I'm going to write a talking dog movie right. now, you know? <laughs> don't. Don't do that. You know, write the movie that you want to write, and right. it doesn't matter if no one's buying that movie. I right. mean, I never moved to L.A. because I didn't think they cared about what I was trying to do. So I tried to do my thing on my own. Right. And that's how I hooked up with Spike. Right, mm -hmm. right. If I had made my movie on my own, telling my story the way I wanted to do it, right. I didn't would have got a break. Because right. they weren't going to give me a chance to tell my story out there. Right, right. So it's all about doing your thing. Hi, good evening. My name is Nikayla Reed. I'm a theater major, and I'm also a trumpet player. Uh-oh, watch um, <laughs> Double trouble. I just want to say thank you for just being yourselves and giving your art to us. It surely has inspired me growing up. Um, my dad is Ronnie Reed Sr. He was in Ninth Street. Um, he played hey, my man! Yeah. That's one of my I movies. promised him that I would say, uh, I tell him that he said hi to Yeah, yeah, give my very best. <laughs> um, give my very best. So I, I had watched Ninth Street earlier this morning when I woke up. Oh, beautiful. And so I grew up with all of your work. And I just want to say thank you for inspiring me and in all the generations to come. And your work matters. So thank you, thank you. That's it. Thank you, thank you. You know, let me just let me just let me just tell you something. You know, um, years ago, man, um, when I was a kid, they took us to the symphony in New Orleans to hear the orchestra, right? And it was one black person in the orchestra. He played flute, right? And years later, I, I'm doing a film, it's going to film in New Orleans, and I get a chance to hire him, right? And I got emotional talking to him, you know, because I said, you know, and he came by and he said, man, I'm proud of what you've been doing. And I just had to tell him, I said, you don't understand. I saw you when I was a kid in elementary school, and you're the reason why I'm doing this. And you know what he told me? He said, you're the reason why I stayed. You wow. know what I mean? So kudos to you too. Yes. You're the reason why we do this. You know, it's, it's, this is much bigger than us as individuals. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? This is about spreading this whole idea of what's possible and showing you that we're no different than you and you have the ability to do anything it is that you want to do in this world if you put forth the effort. Like the Bible, it says, I would tell my students, it says, seeking ye shall find. It doesn't say ye shall find. Seek, and ye shall find. So her, her dad is is a great trumpet player, and uh, you guys will appreciate this. So my film Ninth Street. Ninth Street was the red light district mm -hmm. in my hometown. Oh, okay. Junction City, 15 miles from here, and that's where my parents met. My mother ran a pool hall on Ninth Street. Watch out. Uh, we had trick babies that lived in my house. Mm -hmm. um, my father used to gamble down there. We knew we had pimps in our family. Mm -hmm. We had hustlers. All those guys were in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And my first film is about that. Mm -hmm. And it's about the wine drinkers that, that kind of educated me as a kid. Yes. You know those guys in the yes. neighborhood who yes. would talk to you? Mm -hmm. Yep. And they were typically alcoholics, yep. right? mm -hmm. but they would talk to you. And, oh. and they, one of the guys was a Buffalo soldier, had fought in Italy in right. World War II, right. lived in our basement. Right. And you take all of that stuff that, and her dad, when we made this film, we didn't have any money. And quick story. It's like, not that quick. <laughs> <laughs> That's an old joke we did backstage. <laughs> quick story. Right. So, how, so how, how I made the film was I, was I was living in New York, and I came back to, to Kansas City to try to get the movie made. I had $5,000. Mm. And, and they, were, they were starting the Kansas City Film Commission. And it just happened to be, and they would drive me around like as if I was some big movie producer. I had $5,000. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
And they, and they were starting the Kansas City Film Commission, so they were announcing it to the press that day. Right. And they said, would you like to announce your film? <laughs> All the press is here because it's the Kansas City Film Commission's right. big announcement. Right. And I said, yeah, why not? Right, right, right. right. So I announced my movie. Uh -huh. I had 700 people audition for the film. Wow. One of them was her dad. Wow. I wow. got all the antique cars for the movie. Wow. I got all the extras for the movie. See how that works? I got all the costumes for the film. Mm, and that's how I got everything I needed for the movie except the money. <laughs> yeah. But I eventually got the money. And there's an old saying that you throw your hat over the fence and then you have to go get it. Get it. There you go. And so you have to believe in yourself enough yes, yes. to throw your hat over the fence yes. because you're going to go get it. There you yeah, go. There That's you beautiful. Go. Yes. Um, what has been your biggest motivator whenever you encountered struggles throughout your career? And what is the favorite, like, your favorite thing about what you're currently doing? What was the last, what was the last part I lost the last? What's the favorite thing about what it is that you're doing right now? Oh, uh, let, me, let me hit that one. That, that's good. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one of my favorite things is that I used to be a um, sort of like a solitary artist that worked in the studio and did his thing all along, all, all alone. And when I learned how to do computer animation, that changed a little bit, but I still ran back to my studio and worked all along. Um, and I had the opportunity to work for a company that built bridges where I couldn't touch anything and I had to work collaboratively with people. Long story short, one of the things that I get to say at this point in my life, the thing that's most interesting is that you get to collaborate with people. And you get to work widely with, uh, with, uh, with students, with some of my colleagues, with, um, with like, uh, and also I get to work with this guy next to me over here and, you know, work out and exercise my synesthetic impulse on his music. <laughs> and, and, and it's those sort of, at this point in my life, it's those collaborations, the ability to work with people and how it creates a learning experience. Everything that you do is a learning experience, both a learning experience and in the words of great Wayne Shorter, it's a dare. I dare you. I dare you, I, <laughs> yeah. I dare you, and, right. and, and, and that is, at this moment, uh, that's, the, that's the beautiful, that, that, that's the beautiful thing. I'll tackle the other part, the struggle part, right? You know, I think, and you guys correct me if it's different for you guys, but for me, I think sometimes I'm struggling with something because I have an expectation. And what I'm doing is not meeting that expectation, right? But that's when, I have to realize my expectation was just the starting point, but the piece itself is something else. And you have to throw that away sometimes, you know? Um, there have been so many compositions that I've written that turn out fine, but it wasn't the way that I initially thought of it. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was, I conceived of it being this or being something else, and then you get in and you go, oh, okay, and you start moving around and you go back to that skill thing that I was talking about. And here's the most important thing, I think, sometimes. I was telling uh, some of the kids this earlier today. Um, take a break. Mm. Take a break. There's no shame in it. You know, there's folklore that we all experience in that so-and-so would just be in his studio for 12 hours straight. You know, we always hear these, these crazy stories about, you know, you know, Sonny Rollins played 20 courses and never repeated himself. You know, there's all of that folklore that, that exists, right? There's, those people are human. It's folklore for a reason, you know. Take a break, you Even know. A boxer gets to sit down between rounds. <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> he, he's not fighting all the time, <laughs> you know. Yeah, because I think, you know, your mind is a muscle, right? And the muscle needs to re, re, replenish itself. So, when, you know, when I, was, when I was younger, man, doing this, I used to watch stupid TV. You know, because I, I wasn't, a, I didn't know how to turn my brain off at the time. So I had to watch like Ricky Lake and Jerry Springer and stuff <laughs> like that. <laughs> Literally, you know, I just, seriously. Cause you know, you, you sit there, you concentrate on something and you put on Ricky Lake and you go, man, where did she find these people? <laughs> and the next thing you know, your brain is off into a whole nother area, right? And when you come back to your piece, right? It's relaxed, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? And you yeah. can look at it differently, yeah. yeah. 
Hi, good evening. My name is Vivian Price. I'm a 1993 graduate of Junction City High School. Hey, and back, jump town. Back in those days, my father was telling me about this, and maybe even a few years before, I don't remember the time frame, but he was talking about this young man making a movie about 9th Street. Wow. And it was like in the back of my head, and I just knew, and you know, I think he mentioned it maybe once or twice, and then years later, like literally five or six years later, something struck me, and I was like, 9th Street, and I think it could have been, I can't remember now, Klansman had, Black Klansman had come out or something, I remembered your name. So then I Googled you, went on YouTube, and finally saw 9th Street. So now this comment kind of falls short because you've discussed it <laughs> you before me. Sure. But I was just very excited because all these years, it's like I've had kind of a vision of you, this man from Junction who made this movie, and I finally got to see it. Mm. Um, but I want to say this conversation was really, really wonderful, and it, I think it really kind of fostered creativity. And just listening to you okay. speak, that has been lying dormant for a long time. Mm. I really appreciate the connection of music to movie scores. Um, I think Spike Lee has done a really wonderful job with all of his movies. My favorite is with Mo Better Blues. Mm -hmm. My husband has watched that probably a hundred times just <laughs> with the music. It's amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I also, I guess, as a question wise, um, we talked about different art forms. And I was wondering if you ever think about dance. I know that whenever I hear music, what immediately I'm choreographing. Um, even when I see certain, even visual art, I, I think mm -hmm. of a dance. Mm -hmm. And in movie, movies or, you know, screen works as well, how dance mm -hmm. comes into play. And I would just like your thoughts on that. It's so interesting that you say, say that because the last project that we worked on was, we called it Caravan, right? And basically what it was, it was Rennie Harris's dance troupe entitled Pure Movement, the E Collective with my band and him doing the digital mapping to tell this story about gun violence, right? It was a very, very powerful piece, you know? Um, and it was one of those things, man, we were flying by the seat of our pants, you know? Cause we were like, I don't know how this is gonna work. Hey, everybody was missing cues. Like, oh damn, there it was, okay, let's go back. Okay, let's start again, right. you know? But when it came together, it's magic. It's just magic. The imagery that he put together, oh my God. It was, I, I, I wish I had a slideshow to show you because one of the things that Andrew does, and you'll see tomorrow, he doesn't have, and, and he doesn't have one style. I don't know if I'm saying it right, but like there's a, there's a within his voice, you'll see it's, he definitely has a voice, but within that, there's a multitude of things that he's saying throughout the, all of the visual stuff and the way that he does it because he's doing it in real time, right? So it's not like it's static. He's creating this, put, he has these images and then he's moving them around and doing things with them in real time. And that in conjunction with these dancers, man, it was, there was, there was this, the, 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 I'll just tell you this, the way that the thing ended was one of the kids was shot, right? And the band was set up in the back and the whole, obviously the whole stage was set up for the dancers. And at the end of it, after all of this imagery, we, they combined me with the dancer where this guy was improvising this piece at the end and I'm walking behind him like playing, you know, and it's the end of the thing. Cause he's, in, he's distraught because his brother, his, his friend just died, you know? And the combination of all of those things coming together you know, it was one of those things I was talking about earlier where you have to have trust because, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a dancer. I'm used to like stay in my little spot, play my little solos and go about my business, you know? Right. But, but, but Rennie was saying, no, you need to be involved. Right. And he shot the video of one of the shows. And when I saw it, I went, oh my God, I got emotional, you know, just watching it. But that's the thing, it goes to her question about some of the things that you, you, you really love doing. This is one of them. Because, because it goes well beyond just my little realm of art. It's, it's like trying to take all of the technology that we have at our disposal, right, to make a, an artistic statement. Wow, thank you. I think we have time for at least one more. So at the beginning of this conversation, you said that I don't believe our histories can be taken from us. I was wondering if you think history can be lost and what an artist should do in the face of the fear that they've forgotten their history. You know what's interesting about you saying that? That's a very interesting question because 
my mind has changed about that over the years because Art Blake used to tell us all, he used to tell us something all the time. He said, man, if you're not careful, if you guys don't really stay up on this, Duke Ellington will be white, uh, Bird will be white. You know, and he used to tell us this all the time. And I think that that notion is starting to change because with this digital age that we're living in, there's too much information out there. You know, and I granted, there's a lot of false information. You can't believe everything you see on the internet, obviously. Um, but there's too many people doing really great work and there's too many, I hate to use this phrase, but there are too many people who are aware, I was gonna say conscious, okay. you know, but too many people who are aware of the pitfalls of all of these things to let that happen. You know, when you have a person like Kevin or Andrew or Spike or Casey Lemons or this, this young choreographer in New York, uh, Camille Brown, when you have these people who are dedicated to their craft, they are upholding that just by what it is that they do, you know? Um, and there will always be moments that will challenge us, obviously, you know, like right now, we live in, we're living in kind of like a interesting time when it comes to facts, Yeah, you know? Uh, so it's a, it's a struggle dealing with that, right? But you can't deny the art. That's the thing that, I, like, we always used to say that. It's like, you could talk all you want, but John Coltrane could play. There was, no, there was no denying that. What he did was beautiful, right? What these guys are doing is beautiful. You can't deny it. You can sit down and try to, you know, do whatever you want, but people are being affected by it. When we did Black Klansman, that should tell you, to, that should tell the tale, right? That was a movie that nobody wanted to make, I bet. Not too many people. But Spike was brave enough to do it, and he did it in such a way that it had a resounding response. Not because it was nominated for an Oscar, not that, no, not that. It was, there was a resounding response from the public yes. that saw it and, and felt something as a result of it. So, you know, I'm on the fence about this, you know, a little bit because I understood what Art Blakey was saying about the possibility of things being whitewashed in our history, but there seems to be too many angels on this planet who are trying to preserve that, that heritage just by what it is that they do. Yeah, I, I would second what, what Terrence is saying. You know, I, I think too though that, you know, the fact that um, this like critical race theory oh, man, and that yeah. stuff that is really designed more than anything to erase history. Mm -hmm. And, you know, no one's history is pretty. Mm. Any country, any nation, mm -hmm. any culture, mm -hmm. any race, no one's history is pretty. And right now, I think like American history owns us. We don't really own American history. Mm -hmm. That's why they want to erase it. That's why they don't want it to be taught in school. Because when you tell our history, it's like we've spent our whole lives really trying to be honest about the black experience in various ways, mm -hmm. and which in the end is the human experience. Mm -hmm. and, and when you do that, when you're honest about your history, it creates empathy. That's what they're afraid of. Yeah. They're afraid that you're going to feel for trans folks, for gay folks, for women, for the Ukrainians, for the, for the Nigerians, for, for, the, for, the, for the Haitians, just the list is endless. Yes. And so don't allow them to take the history from you because when they, when they want to take the history from you, they're really taking your feeling and your humanity from you. Mm -hmm. Because our pain, <laughs> mm -hmm. Our pain is what makes us all human beings. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're trying to take away from. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Um, I feel like we've reached an end here. Did you have something you wanted to? OK. Yes. <laughs> wow, that was so powerful. And, and it takes me back what you were just saying, Kevin, to the comment you made about 
realizing that you're not alone when you collaborate with another artist. I think in the largest sense, art offers that possibility to every human being. Finding out that another human experienced something you can connect with. Yes. So I, I think it's so powerful. Thank you so much for everything you said tonight. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank you. And now we have a little thank you gift for you, Kevin. Um, <laughs> the museum staff was in an unusual position that we had one Gordon Parks photograph oh. left from a limited edition set of prints that he made for the museum wow. years ago. Well, before there was a museum, he uh -huh. made it for K-State, for the Friends of Art, before there was a museum. And um, we were like, well, we're not gonna just sell this thing, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's not in our collection. It was made to be distributed to art lovers at a reasonable price. That was the whole idea. So our staff thought, let's give it to Kevin Wilmot oh, in recognition yeah, of everything beautiful. he that's does for our great. communities here, mm -hmm. for Junction City, for Manhattan, for Lawrence, for all of us. Yeah, that's great. So, Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> I want to thank you wow. so much, Linda, for this. Um, you know, Gordon Parks, for me, as a kid growing up in Kansas, was uh, my, my role model. And when I saw The Learning Tree, in 1969 in the Call Theater in Junction City. Uh, and it was really th this thing I saw on TV after that, which was a little short film that showed him making the film mm -hmm. in Fort Scott, Kansas. And that's the first time I saw a black person behind a camera. Yeah, that's on, yes. And that's And when you, see, when you see someone doing this thing that's in your head that you want to do as a kid, it's a very, very, very powerful thing. So, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Chambers looks like Native American. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's good. We're going to see that tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so, I have the distinct honor of thanking everybody for coming this evening. Uh, thank you, Linda. Thank you to our panel. And uh, in, enjoy the rest of the evening and have a safe drive home. Thank you, everyone. Be sure and come back tomorrow. See you tomorrow for an amazing performance. Beautiful. That's good.